So um, I'm Terry Shea. I'm with a company called Kubler. We have a Kubernetes management platform that I'll tell you a little bit about. But when I was thinking about talking today, I, I thought about, you know, I've been around for a little while. And I remember about 20 years ago, I was working for a company called Sterling Software, and I was at our uh, customer conference up in Dallas. And Sterling Williams, the CEO, got up and started talking about how companies were struggling with what the web was going to mean, right? And so he said that there was this concept of disintermediation. And I thought, well, that's a big word, right? He'd been talking to some of the uh, analyst firms like McKinsey and others. And the idea was obviously that, you know, producers and consumers might communicate more directly and via the web you might just go to the producer and buy your product instead of going to a retailer. We've certainly seen a lot of change in the last 20 years. That's okay. And, uh, and, uh, but what we probably didn't see was that um, you know, things like Amazon would come along and things like Uber would come along and things that would disrupt entire industries would come along. And now we're seeing a lot of uh, technology related to cloud-native stuff like containers and Kubernetes being used for this disruption. And what I wanted to talk about a little bit today is how 20 years ago we didn't see how everything was going to roll out. Today we probably don't see how everything is going to roll out. And if you think about um, what type of applications people are using for um, using with the containers and Kubernetes, you can... I think, I think I'm having a problem here. The other one. There you go. Operator error. Um, you, you will see that, uh, that it's probably, a what we're seeing in the market is a little bit different than what we hear about um, every day. So Kubler is a company that's been spun out by East Bank Technologies. And East Bank is a custom software development company. And about three years ago, our CTO, started seeing the need for using containers in production in our projects. And, um, you know, the environments that they needed to be deployed to included on-premise and cloud environments and hybrid environments as well. And we were looking for uh, sort of a um, platform that we could use in those environments and decided to go ahead and uh, build the uh, Kubler solution. And so, uh, at the time, they were looking at, you know, Docker being great, but it's really local, and Kubernetes is great, but it's great once it's up and running. So how do you get it up and running and handle all the operational and governance aspects of that? And so we'll talk about that a little bit towards the end, but for now, I want to talk about what we're seeing in the market, which is that a lot of the uh, solutions uh, that were originally using Docker and Kubernetes were web and mobile applications, maybe 12-factor apps, and a lot of them were stateless to start. And then over time, more stateful applications uh, started using containers and Kubernetes. And you certainly saw a lot of digital transformation and application modernization projects using the, the tech stack as well. Uh, but what we've seen in the last year has been a tremendous uptick in data science, machine learning, AI projects using Kubernetes. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well and what impact that might have on your organizations. We're also seeing a lot going on with software-defined networking and network function virtualization. So if you are in the communications sector, this will probably impact you in a big way. And then a lot going on with Internet of Things, right? So IoT and with uh, you know, 5G and edge computing coming out, um, there's going to be a lot more data coming in from external uh, devices and locations. So again, this could be very industry dependent. But when you think about DevOps, Agile, process and transformation, and you start thinking about the applications that are going to use this tech stack, it's probably broader than we're hearing about in general in the media. And that's what we're seeing when, we are, when we're out talking to uh, customers. So people also want to run these uh, applications in a variety of uh, environments, right? So on-premise, in private cloud, in hybrid cloud environments, in multi-cloud, and even increasingly in edge environments as well. So the next slide, hey, I, I got this down now, I think. Uh, the next slide talks a little bit about, um, you know, what we're seeing in some application considerations. So we could probably, um, you know, go for an hour on this, and I don't want to do that. But um, with data science, machine learning, and AI, there are a lot of interesting things going on with some of the Apache projects. So with uh, Spark and Kafka, they've actually created what are called operators. And those operators from 
the uh, framework, from the Apache framework, can call Kubernetes and say, spin me up some pods, spin down some pods, run this job, et cetera. You can also have your data scientists use their Jupyter notebooks running inside of Kubernetes as well. And there are a lot of configuration considerations that you can find, um, and there are good companies out there that have, have built this stuff. Um, people working for places like uh, Databricks and Cloudera um, that use this technology themselves. People working at uh, Google, et cetera, have done this. Google came out with Kubeflow, which was their uh, Kubernetes solution for TensorFlow, and it used a project called Case on it, which has since been deprecated. Uh, and then again, Jupyter Notebooks are running inside of, uh, inside of uh, Kubernetes and, and, and uh, in pods as well. What we see in data science is that uh, frequently the need to use uh, specialized hardware comes out. So with GPUs, uh, at first Kubernetes couldn't support GPUs, but if you have a highly parallelized uh, data science project you're running, you can get about 10x improvement using uh, GPUs instead of CPUs. But now you have TPUs, which are you know, tensor processing units, and even you know, field pro programmable gate arrays, uh, so FPGAs. So that's another consideration when you think about data science is what sort of hardware will your data scientists need to, to use. With network function virtualization and software-defined networking, there's a project called ONAP, which is part of the Linux Foundation with the software contributed by AT&T. And then Intel has come out with a, a network overlay for that project called Multis. Uh, so when you're looking at uh, containers and Kubernetes, you may have some specific configuration things that you're going to want to do, depending upon the applications that your, that your users are, are running. Um, with web, mobile, and microservices-oriented applications, uh, I think there was a little talk so far about service meshes. So if you've heard about Istio or Linkerd, those are probably the two that you would want to look at. Uh, one of the speakers yesterday, I think it was Dan Kirkpatrick, said he liked Linkerd better than Istio, which I found interesting because uh, Istio probably has better mind share in the market today, but that would be, those would be the two that, that I would look at. And then when we talk to customers about their web and mobile and, and microservices oriented applications, outside of Kubernetes, they're used to having flexibility for blue-green deployments and canary deployments and those sorts of things. Kubernetes itself uses a rolling deployment as a default mechanism. So there are ways to do it with Kubernetes, but it's a consideration that you may want to you know, think about while you're looking at that sort of thing. With hybrid applications, we're working with some financial services companies on how they handle the auto-scaling of front-end cloud-native resources because um, you, know, you develop uh, auto-scaling capabilities with containers and Kubernetes, and if your application is truly hybrid, on the back-end, you have limited resources going to your back-end systems, and your front-end can overwhelm your back-end. So how do you handle scaling in those environments? And then with uh, IoT and Edge, there's a lot of interesting developments going on now. So the Eclipse Foundation, and I know this tends to be, a number of people have said this is a bit of a Microsoft town, that there's a lot of Microsoft here, uh, so I'm not sure how many Java guys there are in the, in, the, in the audience, but the Eclipse Foundation has gotten together with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation for a working group focusing on edge and IoT projects, and they're defining uh, standards and, and architectures for that as well. And then uh, Huawei came out just in December with a, uh, a, a project called Kube Edge. So I could put another 40 or 50 things up on this slide. The point is, is that um, the diversity of application types and the technologies that you use with containers and Kubernetes and related uh, cloud native technologies um, uh, intersect, right? And so as you're thinking about DevOps and um, container technologies, cloud native technologies, Consider how this is going to evolve over the coming years, that you want to have a flexible architecture that can plug in different components as needed. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how we view operationalizing Kubernetes and centralizing operations. Um, by role, you want different capabilities. So developers, you definitely want to give them self-service capability. You want to make sure they're using conformant Kubernetes because, again, there are different plugins you may wind up using. You, of course, want security and reliability and all the sort of uh, mom and apple pie stuff, right? You know, performance, portability, et cetera. We've done some webinars on portability with uh, Kubernetes and Docker and container applications. If you want to look at those, uh, they're pretty good. And, and I think in general, organizations recognize that they want to have portability of their applications across multiple clouds. 
but when you get down to actually working with developers, it's very, very easy to grab a service and to not really treat it as an external dependency, and so you become less portable. Uh, in terms of the operation side of things, and here we talk about everything from SREs and DevOps and uh, you know, DevSecOps. Yesterday, I think the speaker from Shell talked about data ops, so we could have included that as well. You want to have organization multi-tenancy. You need to have RBAC in order to really to provide things like self-service. Uh, you're going to need uh, monitoring logging. There have been, a, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. There have been a number of uh, of uh, folks focus on that here, and then you know, image management and identity management as well. So what we built with our platform, and what you could use as a pattern, really is the concept of in the middle keeping containers and Kubernetes sort of pure and open source, right? So don't touch that stuff. But around the edges, you want to put in security and governance, and you want to put in operational controls. So there are a lot of different boxes on this diagram. I won't read them all to you. But that's what we've tried to do, is to say that when you're using Kubernetes, make sure that you use something that's open source, and then have your operational and security and governance features uh, included around there as well. So we built a centralized control plane that provides functionality. And here you can see an example on the left-hand side of a Kubernetes cluster running in a data center. And, and it's a prod cluster, but two different clusters running in the cloud, one for POC and one for dev. And then the functionality from an API, the UI, the operations, uh, log collection, monitoring, et cetera. And then down to the infrastructure management layer. So with Kubernetes platforms, frequently there is a relationship between the platform and the automation it includes for interacting with infrastructure deployment. So the guys up here a minute ago were talking about uh, Red Hat and OpenShift and Ansible is their choice there. You see a lot of Terraform in the market nowadays, right? And even things like Chef and Puppet can be used for deploying infrastructure. With our platform in the cloud, we've integrated with things like CloudFormation and Azure resource management templates. We've integrated with VMware, vSphere, and those sorts of things. But the idea is from a single console, you may want your operators to be able to deploy, say, give me these servers or give me these VMs on-premise or in the cloud, and then automatically deploy Kubernetes to it. Because being able to spin up and tear down pods and clusters very quickly and making it easy for your operations team enables your dev teams to use this technology uh, you know, uh, quickly and in an agile fashion. So here's a sort of view of a, of a uh, control plane with uh, uh, a couple of different clusters running. Uh, you can see uh, that it has here, uh, and this is kind of a, a little bit of an older view of our control plane. I'll have to update that. But it has, uh, you know, different functionality along the left. It's sort of a top-level control plane for an IT operations team. What we found when we're deploying um, uh, in enterprise environments is that there really is a tension between cloud-native technologies and enterprise security and governance. So in many enterprises, um, you know, you hear that, hey, you know, these, these, these born-on-the-cloud companies are using containers, they're using Kubernetes, they're spinning things up, they're running very, very fast, but then you run into your operational and security requirements internally. So we've even deployed Kubernetes in isolated environments for financial services companies where they're like, we don't want it going out to the internet and downloading anything at deployment time. It has to go to internal registries, internal uh, uh, image repositories, et cetera. So the idea here on the left, you can see a bit of a screen that says, in a cloud environment, you can deploy to existing VPCs and subnets and security groups instead of having your um, uh, automation platform deploy those automatically. And financial services companies have told us that that's one of their requirements, that they need to not have a solution that's deploying and creating subnets and VPCs that is doing it uh, to existing ones and to keep that in you know, private IP addresses. On the right, you can see a custom cluster specification. So people come to us frequently and say, here are our requirements. And we have a nice UI, but the UI can only do so much compared to what's under the cover. So we will create a custom cluster spec and say, here, use this and go deploy this. So it provides the type of flexibility you need for your security and governance and uh, op you know, operational customization requirements on premise. So talk a little bit about the log collection, mo uh, monitoring and audit um, uh, components here. And uh, I think you've probably heard a few times uh, over the last day and a half that uh, Prometheus 
and Grafana are frequently used in cloud native technologies. So what we've done, and you can see on the slide, is create a solution that utilizes them out of the box and is deployed automatically, and it discovers node services, pods, and the, uh, through the Kubernetes API, and then queries metrics from the endpoints. But we've also then um, created a centralized monitoring capability. So if you have clusters running in multiple environments, and you probably will at some point if you don't already, then you can actually, from a single pane of glass, see your clusters running in Azure, in Amazon, and on-premise in one place. And so we use uh, a number of different solutions in order to, to make that happen. So some of the considerations around monitoring include things like uh, you know, resource tuning for Prometheus. In terms of long-term storage, um, Prometheus is not great for long-term storage. So there's an Uber project called uh, M3 that can be used for that. And then you have file growth with a lot of clusters, you want to have metrics labeling, and you want to look at the load on the API, on the Kubernetes API server. So here's a view of a centralized monitoring screen, and you can see that in the dropdown, you can pick your different uh, clusters running in different environments using this sort of architecture. So you can give your IT operations group, or your depends how you're doing it now, your, your, your developers, if they're supporting their applications, you can give them the ability to look at different environments from a single pane of glass. Uh, our logging leverages Elasticsearch and uses Fluent D uh, as well, running on the nodes, and OS and Kubernetes and container logs uh, are all uh, gathered automatically. And then, at, like with the monitoring, we have uh, centralized log collection that leverages things like uh, RabbitMQ shovels and MQTT for forwarding. So you can have centralized logging and monitoring across multiple environments. So if you guys are interested in this, uh, you know, I could uh, certainly get our CTO to talk to you about how he built this. And uh, again, you can try Kubler or, or treat it as a pattern. So with the cluster uh, centralized logging collection considerations, again, tuning uh, comes into play. The load on the API server comes into play, but you also have log index structure normalization considerations. So in addition to um, what we've talked about so far, other considerations include identity management when you're setting up uh, your clusters. We actually deploy Keycloak under the hood and use that to create identity and, uh, and RBOC and then integrate with uh, single sign-in systems, SAML, OIDP, those sorts of things. Uh, in terms of backup and disaster recovery, um, you know, there are uh, people out there that are backing up mostly configuration and etcd files, but if you have persistent volumes, working with your storage team to do that is important. But also, there are open source projects. There's one that used to be called Arc that's now called Valero that the Heptio guys created. That's a, a good project. And then in terms of Docker image management, you need to have an image repository. And then uh, in terms of air-gapped installs, that's where uh, you get to the point where very, very locked down environments, uh, there are a number of different requirements we can point you to as well in, in those environments. So I thought in closing, I would talk a little bit about some of the CI CD projects we're working with. Um, the guys at Circle CI came to us recently and said, hey, we have this concept of orbs, which are very lightweight, but they could integrate your Kubernetes platform with our CI CD capabilities. And so we're gonna build an orb and probably release it in May and announce it at KubeCon in Barcelona, which will be a nice place to announce it. And um, so the idea is to make it easier to deploy on top of Kubernetes through a CI CD pipeline. There's also some guys at Dynatrace from Austria who came to visit us in Washington DC, where we're headquartered, and they have a project called Keptin that you can check out. And they're trying to do something very similar. Um, their project will eventually leverage application performance management testing for deployment stages and so and for validation. So that's what uh, Dynatrace does, but it's an open source project uh, that's very cool. And we have some uh, online material around using things like Istio and Spinnaker for um, uh, continuous integration and deployments and for doing things like Canary uh, deployments as well. So thank you.